Welcome to the Banyan Edge Podcast. Here's your host, Charles Sizemore. Welcome. I'm your host, Charles Sizemore, and this is the Banyan Edge Podcast. So we have a treat for you this week. We are talking about commercial real estate, specifically office towers, and what that means for the banking sector and the broader economy. In case you have forgotten, there was this thing called the pandemic that happened a few years ago that really sort of changed the map of real estate investing. Uh, on top of that, we have a higher interest rate environment now, which also changes the calculus of what makes a, a, a real estate investment profitable. So to help me walk through all of that is the man himself, Mr. Mike Carr. Mike, how are you? Great, thank you, Charles, for having me. It's been a while, it's nice to have you back on. Yeah, it has been a while. So I, I don't know if you saw it, but uh, Elon Musk, who is never shy about sharing his opinions, he, he made some headlines about a week ago with uh, a tweet, and I'm actually gonna read the tweet verbatim. Per Mr. Musk, commercial real estate is melting down fast. Home values are next. Now this, you know, Musk likes to, to generate attention. He likes to, you know, likes to get his face in print or face on, on screen, his words in print, his face on screen. He likes to be the center of attention, but he's been talking about this for a while. He, he was in an interview on Fox News and he had substantially similar comments. He said, we haven't seen the commercial real estate shoe drop. It's more like an anvil, not a shoe. So he likes to talk and he likes to be a showman. He likes to, to talk big here. But I know that this is something you've been following yourself because you were talking about this before Elon Musk, you wrote a really nice article in the Banyan Edge, uh, middle of May, where you really address the commercial real estate issues. You address what that potentially means for the banking sector. So I, what I thought was particularly interesting is you, you, well, let's just give an example. You give an example of the uh, 22 story office tower located at uh, 350 California Street. It's pre-pandemic value was $300 million. So it just sold for, drum roll, $65 million. That is a rather substantial haircut in a very short period of time. Why don't you walk us through what's going on here? Why, what is this risk in commercial real estate? What's Where did it come from? Where are we? Yeah, so that's the anvil that Musk is talking about. So once you get that first sale, the and, and by the way, I, the, the mental image, whenever I hear anvil, I think of the Bugs Bunny cartoons where there would just be anvils falling out of the sky, landing yeah. on someone's head. That, that's kind of what this looks like. <laughs> exactly what this is. So that one deal changes San Francisco's downtown real estate market because the new owner has a cost basis of $65 million. They can cut rent by half and, and yeah, exactly, and still be profitable. The existing owners who don't have this reduced basis, they are going to lose money trying to compete. And they're competing for a smaller share. Uh, Castle Systems puts out a weekly update on office occupancy. And these are this is the company that, if you've ever been in an office and had to swipe a card, this is the company that offers those systems. If, you, if you've so had to be that data. corporate drone that has to swipe the card, and we've all been there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So they count exactly how many people go in and out. They know how many times they go in and out. And they're saying office occupancy right below 50% compared to what it was. And um, by the way, th this is after companies across the board, tech companies, banks, you name it, they've moved heaven and earth to try to get people back in the office. Like that has been the theme of the last 18 months of just getting people back in the office and it has not been going well. <laughs> no, companies seem to be settling on three days a week. The data showing not many people there on Monday, a little yeah. bit more Tuesday, Thursday, and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, almost no one there Friday. And that seems to be what we're settling into. So this is changing the face of real estate. And, well, and Mike, you, you made a point. You 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 mentioned the uh, okay. So let's talk about that that office tower that that sold and mm -hmm. that you know that that changed the landscape. Anybody that's ever bought or sold a house knows that it comes down to comps. 
what is your house worth? Your house is worth what the other houses in your neighborhood are worth. You know, you, you adjust for square footage. You know, you, figure, you, you look at recent home sales and you, you calculate the comps by you know working out what's the cost per square foot. You make some qualitative adjustments for upgrades or whatever, but that's how you value your house. That's how you know what to sell it for. So the comps have just massively shifted in the office market here. Now that that's the new price, how, if you are the building owner, th that's what you're, that's what the banks are looking at. That's what potential buyers are looking at. That's what everybody's looking at as the new comp. That's the new price per square foot. And that's disastrous. Um, yes. If I'm the owner and the comp next to me is worth less than half of what I owe, I'm going to drive over to the bank, drop the keys at their door, and just keep going. And that's the risk right now. So back in 2008, I you know everybody focused on housing, where a lot of owners did drive to the bank, drop the keys off, and move. Um, commercial real estate also suffered. The default rate went up to 10% on those loans. We're rising again on the commercial default rate. We're at about 4% right now and rising. If we hit 10 11%, that's disastrous for the economy, uh, and we are headed it is. there. Well, and, and but but let's let's go into why. So if someone hears ten eh, percent, that doesn't sound so bad. You still have ninety percent that are that are performing. Like why is that such a big deal? Well, it comes down to the L word, leverage. Like that's that that's it. When you have uh, everything levered like you do in, in real estate, that that's a big problem like i that's that that's it when you what's the typical mortgage on a commercial property 90 percent more i mean it, it's it, so everything gets multiplied your gains are multiplied when things are good but then when those rental checks aren't coming in like they're supposed to that's a big problem when you're levered and then we have to look at the other side of the equation the banks are levered too remember let's go back to 2007 bear stearns was levered 30 to 1 so a 4% decline in the market pushed them to bankruptcy. That's it. That's all too. Now, I know nobody out there is levered at 30 to 1 this time because that'd be absurd. And you know, people learn from history. So there's no way anybody's they, over leveraged. Do, but yeah. do they, Do they, Mike? <laughs> I am positive somebody is leveraged at 50 to 1. And we don't know who yet, but it's gonna. we're going to see shortly. Um and the system's going to start just toppling as these defaults rise. Now you remember that's going to work to cut well, rates. What well, you, you, you remember how, how 2008 played out? What happened was we had a huge glut of unsold houses. When uh, you know John Q. Homeowner realized that okay, my, my mortgage is whatever five hundred thousand, and the house is worth two fifty. There's I'm just walking away. I have no equity in the deal. I'm just going to walk away, eat my loss, and start over. You know, drop the keys at the bank and you're done. What happened was, uh, you know, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, um, you know, all the banks, you know, they they basically worked out a huge process to sell off the these houses, and a, a lot of times they were happy to get fifty cents of the dollar or whatever they got. I mean, it was just, but they had this process where they had these huge pools of non-performing loans, and they sold them off at auctions, and. You know, if you're a, an individual investor, you know, you could have bought a house or two, a song, and so long as you could cover the mortgage for a while, eventually you could rent it out, and that's fine. The, what What's different about the situation today as opposed to back then is we're not talking about a house that you could buy for a couple hundred thousand dollars from the bank. We're talking about commercial property that costs tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. So the, clearly the pool of buyers here is much smaller, particularly since the people that would normally be buying real estate investment trust, uh, you know, big pension plans, whatnot, they already have more commercial real estate than they want or need because they had loaded up on it when times were good, interest rates were low, and you really couldn't lose in real estate. So there's no obvious buyer right now. I don't know who the banks are going to sell these bu buildings to when the keys get dropped off. And I also think, you know, if we look back there, rates were low and falling. Interest rates are high now, and that changes the calculus. So if I buy that new building, even at $65 million, 
my operating costs are probably 20 to 30 million a year to keep that maintained. Um, sure. You know, 10% of its real value a year is a reasonable assumption of what it costs to maintain a building. Yeah, we're not talking about a warehouse here. We're talking about an office building and your tenants expect it to look nice. You can't have cracks in the floor. You can't have shabby looking paint. I mean, it needs to be well maintained or your tenants will leave, particularly since there's a lot of options on the table right now. It's not so hard yeah. for them to leave. So these are high risk right now. And I think that the cracks are going to flow through the economy. It's not just the big office buildings. Those are going to get the headlines, but it's the local strip malls too. Um, so we moved to Scottsdale about two years ago. And my wife was commenting over the weekend. She is shocked when she goes into Yelp to see places she wants to visit. And so many of them are already out of business. You know, the turnover in small businesses is huge in places like this. And this is one of the areas of the country doing well. Sure, so the Sun Belt. You'd see that elsewhere, too. I mean, Yelp does track small businesses. And, you know, if you just put a lot of them in that you want to visit and they're not there next time you get to that area, it's a sign something's shifting in the economy. I think that's where we are right now. We are for sure. And you look at some of the the, the broader themes, the the pandemic stimulus, not, not even the pandemic itself, but the stimulus we got from the pandemic kept a lot of small businesses alive. A lot of small businesses that may not have been viable in, in this kind of new environment we're in. All of a sudden, you know, the pandemic stimulus is now long gone. Financing rates are now much higher. You know, many small businesses do carry debt. Servicing that debt's a lot harder than it used to be. And we've had this, I think you called it the most anticipated recession in history, were your exact words, if I do recall. Uh, yeah. We are eventually going to get a recession. I, I, I don't know if it happens next week, next month, whenever it happens. I mean, it, we, we are going to get a recession. It's uh, We have not rewritten the laws of the universe. There will be a recession. And when that happens, you are going to see uh, small businesses are obviously the first ones to fold up shop. So that that sort of puts even more pressure on on, on some of these, uh, yeah, not, not not at the huge office towers, of course, but these smaller properties, the strip malls and such, as you said. So that that shoe, or shall we say, and village, is also yet to fall. So I mean, the question is, what do you do? And now is the time to prepare for this kind of a disaster that's coming. You know, but, don't but, leverage hold on, my, hold, hold that thought just one second. Let's talk about just the size of this. This is something you pointed out in your article, and that, that's what really popped off the page for me. You said, I believe the number was 270 million, no, sorry, billion with a B, 270 billion per year over the next three years has to be refinanced by the banks. It, it, th those were the numbers, right? Yeah, and that's from Goldman's research. So it's a good number to hang on to. That's closing in on close to a trillion. That's more than three quarters of a mm -hmm. trillion dollars that has to be refinanced in just the next three years. Refinanced at rates that are likely at a minimum double what they were when these were last financed. So you're talking about your financing cost roughly doubling, if, if not more, over the next three years in a market in which you have fewer people willing to pay the rent because they just don't need the space. They're not using as much as you need. Company X, fill in the blank, whoever, uh, Twitter, Tesla, whoever, just, just pick one. Whereas they needed you know, a certain amount of office space before work from home became a reality, they don't need as much anymore. So they're not, even though they're desperate to get their people in the office, they're, they're smart enough to see the reality of we're not going to pay rent for a half empty building. Like we're not, we're going to reduce our footprint. Maybe we renew half of our lease. We're not going to renew the whole thing or, or half of our lease, half of our square footage. We're not going to renew the whole thing. And we're also going to demand cheaper rent in the process. So good luck. If you are a Mr. Building owner and you're like, oh, I have this hundred million dollar loan due. Uh, my tenants are all demanding to pay lower rent and also at the same time take less space from me. I'm going to be in a really uncomfortable spot when I have to sit across the desk for Mr. Bank President. And that's where we're at. <laughs> that's what we're looking at over the next three years. Yes. Yeah, so now um, 
And, you know, the quotes attributed to many people, but, you know, the idea was if I owe the bank a hundred dollars and I can't pay him, that's my problem. If I owe the bank a hundred million and I can't repay him, that's the bank's problem. Um, you know, if they lease a yacht to me, they don't want to take that back. The bank no. can't afford to keep that yacht in service. So no. that's where we are now. They're, they're sitting there to renegotiate their loans, but they are the bank's problem more so than the building owner's problem on that loan because the bank can't take all that property back. The building owner knows he's, you know, his goose is cooked on that. He knows. Mm -hmm. And if, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're an investor, you know that not every deal works out. Some don't. And you have to know when to cut your loss. It doesn't matter if it's a 24-hour option trade or if it's a 24-year commercial investment. You know when to cut your loss and you move on. And so that's that's where we are. You're going to have a lot of investors just kind of cutting that loss, saying, okay, we're done. We can't, <laughs> this is not sustainable. So uh, Mr. Bank, you deal with this. So that's that's where we are. That's That's why you've said that you think this will ultimately be a bigger problem for the banking sector than 2008 was. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is the bank's problem at this point. <laughs> so I cut you off before. You were about to tell us what to do about it. You should not over leverage. You know, now is not the time to be buying stocks on margin. Um, now is the time to maybe take some profits, hold some cash, and be ready when the banks are panicking. Because the panic, I think, is going to mirror what we've seen in history. It's going to be Mike, pretty I know bad. you're you're all, you're a tactical investor. You know, you're mm -hmm. you 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 change with market conditions. You don't go into a trade with a preconceived view. You you change. You adapt as market conditions adapt. You're 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 very tactical in, in nature. So what what you're suggesting is as we enter this, not you don't necessarily need to just hide your money in a mason jar in the backyard, but be a bit right. more liquid, don't be as aggressive, You know, have cash on hand to pounce. What do you think some of the opportunities, I, I, what, 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 do you, what would you consider an opportunity in this environment? I think focus on the short term. Um, if you want to look further out, look at ways to benefit from declines in banks and I think Adam O'Dell is doing that, and he's doing it very smartly. And I don't know if you've seen Adam's latest research. I have. And actually, we'll put a link to that below the video here. Adam has actually made the banking crisis his critical focus this year. I, I, you're not the only person to be looking at this, Mike. Adam has also been looking. I know, I know you two work, work very closely together as well. And Adam has actually been putting a trading strategy together to capitalize on what he sees is a potential collapse of the banking sector. And I think that actually is the key. Whereas that it's the real estate makes the headlines, you know, that, that the buildings in San Francisco, for example, okay, wow, that office tower is, you know, wow, that that's that's in bad shape. The commercial real estate sector is in bad shape here. That's what gets the headline. But it's that next step is who's who's left holding the bag, who actually suffers, what's What's the next domino to fall? It's it's the banks. Like I, that's where the real risk is, and so that that's where Adam is, is focusing. He's focusing on the uh, what you know how to profit from a collapse of the banking sector. So we will put a link you know below for for people to check that out. I do strongly recommend that. Adam is very uh, yeah. I, Mike Adam gives you a run for the money, and who's more methodical and prepared? I mean, you guys both do an absolute ton of research before you you make any trade. You, you, you run the numbers every which way they can be run, and he's yeah. put a ton of of time into this. So uh, I, I do recommend anybody watching this. Uh, yeah, please please do follow the link. You will be glad you did. Now, Mike, just I know you uh, you don't make predictions. What was the Yogi Berra quote? I don't make predictions, particularly about the future, but if you were going to guess, what's the timeline on this look, out, look like? When, when do you think the dominoes really start falling? I think at the earliest in the fall, early next year. So that gives us some time here, and that's broader economy. I think what we're seeing is, um, I think Goldman or Morgan Stanley has termed this market the Magnificent Seven. 
and there's seven stocks driving the indexes. Yeah. So, and by know, the way, pick, we all know the names. They're all the big tech names that were yeah. leading things in the pandemic. I mean, it's they're, they're back. <laughs> yeah. So it's okay to play this to the upside for a time. Just remember that you know it's time to manage risk. This is 1999 potentially. And yeah, well, melt you know what, Mike? Here. That's actually a really good analogy because 1999 the handwriting was on the wall. It, it, you know, anybody that that had a level head knew that stocks were overpriced and knew it was a bubble, et cetera. But still, there was money to be made. I mean, I, what was the, the NASDAQ roughly doubled between late 1998 and uh, when it finally topped out in early right. 20, uh, early early 2000s. And, and what was that, about 14 months or so? I mean, it doubled yeah. in, a, in those last 14 months. So if you had jumped out of the market too soon, I mean, you would have missed a really good opportunity. So this is this is Mr. Mike Carr here being tactical. This is this is what you do. <laughs> yeah, this is you know, this is the Prince market party like it's 1999, but you know, 2000's coming. So don't overstay. You should copyright that. That's have you have you have you written that down in an article before? Have you said this is a 1999 mark? If you have, I somehow missed that one. But that is I that's didn't a quote. do that yet. But uh, <laughs> that's another Mike Carr original right there. To send us a cease and desist letter, and you know, <laughs> so I collect those. <laughs> have a collection. Yeah, frame them, put them on the wall. But no, I, I think that's it. I, I think like that that that's really the takeaway. Is look, we have the storm cloud. We see it coming. It's not like we have to have a crystal ball here. The data is there. You have more than three quarters of a trillion dollars in commercial property coming up for uh, coming up for uh, renew renewing their loans, and yeah. buyers are <laughs> who the buyer is going to be. We'll see. Someone will come up and buy it. Of course. The question is at what price and what what kind of haircut are the banks going to take and it, you know how 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 bad does it get how many bank failures do we see of course Silicon Valley Bank First Republic Bank like the list has gotten longer as this year has gone on when's the next wave hit until that hits though there's still money to be made you, you can still make some money on the long side here and uh, although We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see when the, the the timing happens. I think you are right, though. I think the banking system has enough, you know, kind of fingers in the in the dam to keep the water from 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 shooting out. Uh, again, we're kind of going with cartoon analogies here. Anvils falling from the sky, putting your yeah. finger in the dam to keep the water from squirting out. But that's. I think there's enough of that in place to sort of keep it together for the next few months. But then I I think the wheels come off pretty quickly after that. I think so too. All right, it's settled. Then we have, we we we've sorted this out. <laughs> okay. Well, Mike, uh, th thanks for joining me today. It's all it's always great to have you on. Uh, you're you're always very very knowledgeable, uh, very very well read, and you always bring very good information to the table. Uh, Mike's article is on Banyan Edge. So for for our viewers here, go to go to the Banyan Hill website. Go check out his article there. Uh, this one, among many, is uh, available for you to read for free. Uh, also, check us out on YouTube if you haven't already. Um, our, our our stations there. Mike is a repeat guest and always has something good to say. So, Mike, thanks again for joining. Thanks to all of our viewers for joining as well. And until next time, go out and make yourself some money.